Hi, I'm J.M. Fry, and I am the author of The Skylark Song. If you've gotten this far in the bonus content, then that means you've probably listened to the whole book. Thank you so much for listening, and I appreciate all your comments and your reviews on Amazon and Goodreads. Today, uh, for our bonus content, I have a little bit of a surprise for you. I have Kisa Whipke, the editor of The Skylark Song from Roots Publications. Hello, Kisa. Hello. Thank Hello. you for having me. You're very welcome. <laughs> Thank you for letting me bully you into this. <laughs> it wasn't hard. I actually really, really like to talk about these books, so Wonderful. I'm excited to be here. So tell us all about you. Who is Kisa Whipke, the human? Okay, so I am, uh, I started off, I was the uh, acquiring editor. Um, I have now since become the publisher behind Roots Publications, but I still do the heavy lifting on the editing side. That's still what I love to do the most. Um, so that's kind of me. I've been in publishing now since uh, 2011. So it's been a while. <laughs> but um, as old yeah. as my debut novel. A little bit, yeah. That's, that's how old my career is, <laughs> which, you know, for an editor, I guess, is it's a decent amount of time. But yeah, I still feel like I'm learning everything about publishing because no one ever knows everything about publishing. But yeah, anyway, that's who I am. And uh, yeah, yeah, I'm ready to talk well, about and I some was Skylark. Say that uh, publishing changes so quickly. It really does. But like just even I think it was last week I sent you a message filled with question marks and exclamation marks going, wait a minute, they're book review podcasts now? How yeah. am I supposed to stay on top, top of all of this? Yeah, exactly. It's constantly evolving. I don't think it's possible to ever know exactly everything that's going on in all corners of publishing. Yeah, totally. So um, tell us a bit about Roots Publications. So Roots is um, a small independent press. We consider ourselves a boutique press because we like to spend a lot of time crafting the books that we put out into the world. So we tend to publish um, hmm, less than 10 novels uh, comfortably per year. We have done more than that um, in a year, but we tend to like it less than 10. Um, but yeah, we, we focus primarily right now on speculative fiction, um, young adult, uh, all the way through adult. Now we started off just doing young adult and new adult, which we still believe exists, <laughs> even though some of the bigger presses would say otherwise. But um, we actually do believe in new adult and especially new adult for speculative fiction. Mm -hmm. There's an audience for that, I think, that hasn't been fully explored yet. But um, yeah, so we tend to like, we tend to like books that are a little bit out of the normal lanes that you might see. Like we like ones that cross genres. <laughs> we like ones that subvert tropes. Like we like things that are surprising and different and, um, exciting. So that's kind of what we look for. And, um, I like to say the weirder it is, the more likely it is that I'm going to like it. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, my um, novel, The Untold Tale, which was originally pitched to you as mm -hmm. an adult book and as yep. a standalone, um, ended up becoming new adult and a trilogy in four parts. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yep. Um, so we're here to talk about Skylark. So. Yes. How did Skylark land on your desk, fly onto your desk? <laughs> um, where, did, where did you and Skylark collide? Uh, so Skylark actually came to me after we had started um, work on the Accidental Turn series. Um, your agent uh, sent me an email and was like, you know, she has this other book that I think you guys might love. It's young adult instead of new adult. And then she kind of pitched me the idea. And I thought that it sounded like a definite fit for me personally as a reader. So I was, I was absolutely in from the second I read the premise. Um, but that's kind of how it, how it happened. Um, I don't know if she would have pitched it to me if we had, didn't already have the other series um, in the mm -hmm. works. I, I'd like to hope she would have, <laughs> but um, yeah, I definitely think that it, it was a timing 
the timing was just right for that. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm super excited to have Skylark. <laughs> As you know, yeah, you said I routinely, yeah, I, I do consider it one of my favorites um, in our catalog. And it's, uh, yeah, that's one that I'm always like, you guys should read this. So, yeah. <laughs> so what were you, sort of your like first impressions of Skylark when you sat down and actually read it for the first time? What were kind of some of your thoughts? And you don't have to pull your punches because the book's already out now. You can't make me cry. <laughs> um, so I obviously had a lot that I liked about it. Um, I really, really liked the fact that your lead character was a mechanic. Um, you don't see a lot of female characters that are in trade industries, for lack of a better way to say it, that aren't, you know, princesses or other lady type characters. Um, so it was nice to see a girl that gets her hands dirty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I really liked that. And um, the fact that it was an action adventure novel really appealed to me. Um, I definitely had some concerns, if I remember right, about the world building at the time, which we have since addressed and, mm -hmm. and fixed. And um, I, I remember you mentioning that your agent had um, wanted you to add a love story, but I wasn't convinced that the love story that it had at the time was working. <laughs> yeah. So I know we ended up spending a lot of time on that element. Um, and I'm, I'm super happy with how it turned out. Me hopefully too. you are too, yeah. but um, yeah. yeah. And hopefully readers, if you're watching this, you're starting to feel some chemistry. <laughs> so, yeah. All right, so going back to what we were saying about the first yep. agent and the love story, I mean, the story with Skylark for me, I guess I'll, I'll explain where Sky, Skylark came from, mm -hmm. is um, I had never heard of steampunk. I didn't know what it was. Um, I thought it was a genre, not an aesthetic, but I have since been corrected by uh, Mike, the steampunk scholar, Pershawn, that it is an aesthetic, not a genre. Um, and I was hanging out with friends and we had just done a group cosplay um, for an event and then we said okay well let's do another one we, we want to win some awards what what can we do and they said one of my friends said well let's do the x-men and then another friend said oh everyone does the x-men let's do steampunk x-men and I was like what's a steampunk so I was introduced to steampunk in 2009 and uh, for a couple more conventions my friends and I did steampunk versions of things and then I happened to be at a big steampunk convention here in Toronto and someone drunkenly said, well, you're a writer, you can make up a story about anything. And I was like, yeah, I can, because I had also been drinking. And um, someone said, all right, everybody who's in this circle here, everybody in this group of people, make up a story about us. So I went <laughs> around the circle and I figured out, I had everyone tell me their character names and what they did and because of course like when when you've got a steampunk persona you've got a persona so mm -hmm. I found out about everybody's personas and I went away and I came back and I told the story of the Klon Sasquatch in war and just basically was like okay this is this this is that you're this person you're Madame Rosa you're this you're this um and I have to say like that story was the basis of the book but because of course then everyone was like hey that's good you should write that down Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and that was the basis of the book, but so much has changed since then. I think maybe the only thing that is the same is that Robin's name is the Skylark and that Madame Rosa is Madame Rosa. I think that's literally that's the it. only thing that stayed the same. Wow. Um, <laughs> and then, yeah, I ended up writing the first book and I sent it to my then agent and he was the one who said I can't sell YA without a romance in it and this was in 2012 when like you mm -hmm. know Hunger Games was really happening and YA was really happening and right. I was like but it's the middle of a war why in what way would she have any time or brain space for romance mm -hmm. it makes no sense and we did a couple of drafts back and forth and I finally quite spitefully was like, well, fine. If I have to, if I have to have a romance, then she's going to fall in love with a villain and you can just deal with it. 
<laughs> and that's where the enemies and lovers came from because I was just feeling really spiteful about it. And then of course, when I did the first draft, I was like, oh no, this really works. <laughs> okay, how do I make this happen? Yeah. Um, but then of course, there were so many drafts with my previous agents and then a couple of drafts with my new agent that by the time you got your hands on it, it was pretty, it was pretty muddy. Yeah. That's a good way to describe it. It was, uh, I could definitely feel that it had gone through a few iterations and it was. 76 drafts. Ooh, yeah, that's a lot. That's a lot of different, different versions to deal with. Um, yeah. So it, it definitely felt like it was not sure who it was <laughs> when I first saw it, um, which I, hope we managed to iron out <laughs> over the course of the production. So, um, yeah. but yeah, uh, that's interesting that, that YA has to have a romance in it. I don't know if that's the position we still have in YA or. I don't, I don't think so. Leslie Livingston, who is the YA author behind Wondrous Strange and, um, and the uh, Once Every Never trilogies, She's a wonderful writer, and uh, she always says, this is what, it, it's such a great description, YA is about your first. Mm -hmm. It's your first kiss, it's your first crush, it's the first time you kill a man in the arena, it's the first time you betray your government. YA are, is, is firsts, mm -hmm. and because of that, I think a lot of people feel like first romance has to be part of that, first kiss, mm -hmm. first serious relationship. Um, but I, I mean, I have friends who are teachers and their children, their students are, are YA reading age. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these students are going, ugh, another chosen one. Ugh, another yeah. romance. Ugh. Exactly. So what the industry thinks that the audience wants and what the audience actually wants, are, it's, it's been very interesting. So I wrote Skylark to please mm -hmm. my friend's students. And nice. Uh, and myself, because I was definitely the kind of reader at that age where it was like, okay, let's just skip the romance and get to the story. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and then to have an agent turn around and say, no, that must be romance. But I think in the end, it did make the book stronger. I agree. I, I honestly, that's probably one of my favorite parts of the story. Um, well, it became the impetus of the story because yeah. as soon as I added the romance, I was like, aha, now I understand what the ending is. Mm -hmm. And now I understand why it has to be that way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so speaking of endings, uh, the book as it stands now is, is not how it was when you first read it. So no. <laughs> talk to me about the process about where we decided to split the story. So originally when it was pitched to me, it was pitched as the typical YA trilogy. Um, so there were supposed to be three books and two of them, I believe, had not been written. Um, so you knew ultimately where the series was going, but um, not how we were going to get there. Yeah. So what became the duology was actually the first book in the trilogy. Um, so the, the story that I read uh, was basically both books in one, um, and that was supposed to be the first book. That was the Skylark song, and um, after we started talking about it and talking about the series, you mentioned that you didn't feel that you had enough material or really didn't want to do a three-book arc. Um, there just wasn't enough story there. Right, and uh, I... I think that that world is rich enough that you probably could have come up with more, but I also agree that I think the story that you wanted to tell is told best as it is now. Um, and there was, when I read the, the initial draft, there was a definite shift in the middle um, where I was like, Ooh, that's where it breaks. Like there's basically two halves to the story and it would be real easy to just separate them right there in the middle. Um, so that's basically what we ended up doing. <laughs> yeah. And it, it was pretty much almost perfect. I think, I mean, because the other problem was J.M. Fry is a chronic overwriter. <laughs> it was very long. Yes. <laughs> and it was like 128,000 words. Yep. Uh, when a typical YA is between 75 and 90. Mm -hmm. um, 
oops. Uh, but uh, so that was the other problem is you guys had said, you know, if this is book number one, we have to cut out 60,000 words. And I was like, uh, no, mm -hmm. there's no way to tell this story missing that much of it. Um, so that's where we sort of came up with the solution of cutting the book in half and making it a duology. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it ended up being like 69,000 words and like 65,000 words. It ended up being almost perfect. Like perfectly in the middle. Yeah. 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 And yeah. then I think there was, there was a little bit more added to, there was a lot more added to the, the second book and we yes. completely rewrote, act, like completely rewrote act three mm -hmm. twice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I rewrote the whole thing based on your notes and then you were like yeah I read what you did and you did exactly what I asked you to do but I realized that I shouldn't have asked you to do that so yep. can you rewrite the whole third act again and I was Hi. like ah. <laughs> I drank a bit and I cried a bit and I swore a bit and then I just did it um but the, the first book only really needed you know a couple chapters in it to just really mm -hmm flesh out what was happening right yeah so um yeah it was <laughs> that was actually a rare moment in my career i have not done that to a lot of people so sorry <laughs> <laughs> That's okay well you know what i trusted you when you said that because we yeah. have the relationship of the other four books that came before this yes and um i i found so here's here's jm fry the chronicle of a writer again um the Untold Tale was never meant to be a series. It was always mm -hmm. meant to be a standalone. And then, very rightly, um, the team at Roots said, well, if it's an epic fantasy series about epic fantasy series where the characters in the epic fantasy series discover that their characters in an epic fantasy series and escape the epic fantasy series, then it must be a trilogy. Mm -hmm. And I said, no. And you said, but <laughs> epic fantasy series are always trilogies. And I went, damn. Yep. Um, so one of the big I problems, think you had even already had that in the world building of that series too. Like it was already referenced and I was like, how can you not make this a yeah, trilogy? I just, yeah, but, yeah, I missed, I missed that. And then, um, I had put it in there, but yeah, I just, I didn't use it. So, um, the, the thing that I found very difficult about that series is because I, so I'm a screenwriter by training. So mm -hmm. I write in the three act structure. My books always have three acts, except for Skylark, which weirdly had five. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, but when I, when I put together a series, I also plan the series like a three act structure. So book one mm -hmm. is act one, book two is act two, book three is act three. And because I hadn't planned for that, I was like, oh my god, how do I how do I sustain that mm -hmm. um, over over the two books? And and I hadn't told you this. I, I know this isn't news to you now, but I, I hadn't told you this originally that we'd had a, a, a television network sniffing around the series. Right. And one of the meetings I took with the executive producer, she said, please, dear God, don't give me a mushy middle book. Mm -hmm. You can't give me a crappy season two. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, okay. So... <laughs> I really knew I had to make two strong, but three really eluded me because I had never, I hadn't built a target before I loosed the arrow. Mm -hmm. I didn't know where I was aiming. So all of this to say that you really held my hand through that and you, you did not guide me wrong. So when you said, go write this, I think mm -hmm. the second, the third act of Skylark 2 should be like this. I was like, oh, okay, well, I trust Kisa. Let's, let's give her. Yeah. <laughs> and then and when you, you did and then I was wrong <laughs> the thing is I really like that you said I'm wrong mm -hmm. um you didn't say well we we don't have any time so let's keep it or we don't have enough time so let's just try to make this work you were like nope you did exactly what I asked for but I didn't ask for the right thing let's yep. just do it again and I appreciated that professionalism so much I mean I didn't sleep for a month but I, I and I don't I was, think I did either. <laughs> I, was on the just, I know. Month. I'm sorry. <laughs> plane still took off. Nobody cried. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, so I ended up um, 
having mm -hmm. to redo that whole third act. But yeah, I trusted you that you that you knew that this is what needed to happen. And I'm really pleased with the ending of book two. And no, we're not going to tell you what it is. I want you to go read it, guys. Go read it. <laughs> yes, definitely. I concur with that. The ending of, of book two is it's pretty spectacular. <laughs> oh, thank you. Well, it's interesting because I was at the Kids Lit Gala here in Toronto and um, I was talking to somebody while these edits were happening. And I said, and I think this is, this is what we've decided for the ending. And you're a fellow writer, so you understand. I'm just going to tell you, not worrying about the spoilers. And I said, this is what we're doing. And the circle of like five writers that were standing around me holding champagne flutes, everybody went, <laughs> yeah. Are you really doing that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's amazing. <laughs> it's still one of my favorite, favorite ways to that the series ends. Personally, I mean, it's a, a, a bit of a throw the book at the wall moment <laughs> for me. Yeah. <laughs> but I also love that about it. So I love writing yeah. those though. I, I, the best moment I had in an autograph signing is someone brought me a copy of Triptych and the spine all mm -hmm. in here was crushed and <laughs> the pages were bent. And I was like, what happened to this poor book? And she's like, I threw it against the wall. Yeah. Because I yeah. hate you. And I yeah. was like, cool. Do you want me to sign it? She was like, yes, please. Yes. <laughs> yeah. um, so talking about having to split the book in mm -hmm. half, that meant that there was very clearly like a, there was no ending to book one. It, it right. was very clear that there was going to be a second book. And now we announced it as a duology. Um, right. So there was no question in the reader's minds that a second book was coming. But they did have to wait a whole year mm -hmm. to read the second book. So like, what was the danger of that? And were you ever worried that, that we were leaving um, on a cliffhanger? No. Because I feel that that happens a lot in YA, especially in ones that come right out of the gate, um, saying that it's a series. Mm -hmm. I think there's a tendency in um, especially YA fantasy to do exactly that and just cut it off and leave it on a cliffhanger. Um, I feel like in book one in the Skylark song, we did try to give it at least a little bit of closure. <laughs> um, but we did definitely leave it on a cliffhanger with the intention of it just flowing right into book two. Mm -hmm. um, because that's basically how how the draft I read was. Yeah, um, I think there's a month between like, the, what the, the final yeah. moment of act two, or of, of, of book one. Mm -hmm. I think there's a month or maybe two months between that moment and the moment we pick back up in uh, now, I don't think that was always the case, <laughs> but yes, now, now there's a little bit of time in between, but the, the overall idea in the production of the duology from my standpoint was that ultimately it was one of, I wanted it to be one of those series that people would read back to back. Mm -hmm. Like they wouldn't, they would, yes, they had to wait for it because of the nature of the production pipeline and everything, but, um, I, I wanted people, especially with the way book two ends, to want to go back and read it from the beginning and see it all the way through as one story, like as one complete story. Um, kind of more of a film approach, really, to the way mm -hmm. that, you know, movies that are obviously going to have sequels or whatever, they don't, they don't wrap everything up nicely with a pretty little bow on top. Like, they give you maybe a one thing and then... They're like, and now come back next year to find yeah. out. <laughs> Lord of the Rings so. is the perfect example of that. Everyone yeah. says, why does Lord of the Rings have six endings? And it's like, because there were 20 stories happening and, mm -hmm. and they didn't end any of them at the end of book one or movie one. And they yeah. didn't end any of them at the end of movie two. And I think um, Avengers, Infinity War and mm -hmm. Endgame is another great example of that because yeah. they, they cut, in infinity war on like the worst spot yeah. talk about a cliffhanger yeah. um so i feel like you know i think it's doable but um but you, you can't l leave the audience feeling cheated either right that's the, big that's the key because i definitely came away from infinity war going 
that's it. That's what I paid my money for. Come on. Right? Yeah. 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 There was that anger of being like, no, but it wasn't even but, yeah. like a good fanish anger. I wasn't like, no, now I have to wait a whole year. I was just like, fine. You're I like, guess I'll what? come back. Yeah. Exactly. And that's what I was afraid of with this one. I didn't want people to, to rage quit the series. Right. I actually, I, I don't see a lot of criticism about the cliffhanger ending. Um, mm. In fact, from what I've seen in the reviews, I would say it works successfully. Mm. Like the majority of the reviews, especially recently, um, have been ones where they're like, I have questions and I can't wait and I'm going to read book two right now. So um I mean, it probably helps that they're both immediately available and you can just go get book two right now. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, I actually have not seen a lot of negative feedback in regards to the cliffhanger. So I think I we think pulled it off. We pulled it off. <laughs> pulled it off. Um, so then the other question I wanted to ask is this whole appeal of enemies to lovers. Mm -hmm. why, do we, why do we love that story? I don't I'm honestly know. And Jane Eyre and and Beauty it's and the Beast. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> even White and Royal Blue, uprooted. I'm trying mm -hmm. to think. Yeah, that inevitable Victorian thing. Like pretty much every, pretty much everything I've read in the last year, actually. Now that I think about it, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. I don't know. It's it's very personally appealing to me for some reason. So I was 100% in for it. Um, but I think that it's also challenging to do well. Um, yeah. I, I don't, I think, I think for, for me, part of the appeal is the, the morality being a little bit gray. Like you're never really sure who's truly good or who's truly bad. And um, the instinctive push and pull of, you know, somebody who, do we like this person? Do we not like this person? Like you have differing motivations. And so there's, you know, inevitably there's really good banter and like moments that, you know, kind of get turned on their head a little bit. And it's not as cut and dry, I think, as just a straight up love story where, you know, they walk in the room and you're like, yep, that's the person they're going to end up with. Like, yeah, um, there's sparkage and there's friction yeah. and there's, that's nice. Passion, well, and I, I find it difficult to, um, for me, the enemies to lover was really hard because I didn't want to woobify the villain. Mm -hmm. So it, that's a fan fiction term, which just basically means turning somebody into a wooby, which is like, ah, oh, you know, Loki's the bad guy in Avengers, but he's really misunderstood. And then mm. you, you know, you write a story where Loki is sweet and adorable and, and, and it's just really completely out of character. Mm -hmm. And for me, the challenge of an enemies to lovers story is creating an enemy who is still the enemy, mm -hmm. even though that the hero loves them without, mm -hmm. without de-villainizing the villain and also without villainizing the hero. Because that's the right. other way you could go with it. You could have the vill the hero go off the rails and become a bad guy, right? But yep. keeping them, keeping their dynamic, but then somehow making the dynamic function together mm -hmm. is my God. The number of things I wrote and deleted and wrote and deleted. <laughs> and wrote and deleted. Yeah, yeah. I think that I think the particular challenge for this one um, was the fact that the coyote is just so darn slippery. Like even we didn't know who he was until like yeah. towards the very end of book two. And then we were like, well, yay. Now we have to go back and fix everything. Cause you're not. That. Yeah. Not. Yeah. yeah. What's that saying from Neil Gaiman? Draft one, write everything that happens in the story. Draft two, go back and make it look like you did that on purpose. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what um, we did. So I think, I think he was extra challenging as a character and until we were able to actually pinpoint him, mm -hmm. it made it really difficult to uh, kind of make the dynamic between he and Robin work. Although they did always have chemistry right from the get-go, mm -hmm. even in the original draft. I was like, oh yeah, I like this. This is good. Yeah. I don't like where it goes. It gets a little weird in the middle, but 
Yeah. <laughs> we we can dark. fix that. We got yeah. Dark. Well, and that was that was the whole spite romance thing happening. I really mm -hmm. liked the coyote as the villain. Mm -hmm. And then the minute I was told I had to make it a romance, I was like, how do I make such... A, I mean, he was, in the original draft, he was a horrendous person. He was, yeah. he was not a good person in any shape or form. He was charismatic, mm -hmm. and he was intriguing, and he was magnetic but he wasn't a good person. So then when I started writing that romance, it was like, oh no, this has just turned into a really shady narrative that mm -hmm. should be, you know, like <clears throat> on the front page of the news. <laughs> this isn't yeah. working. So that a lot of going back and reworking that was not, not so much changing the lines. I think we kept a lot of the lines, but changing what happens around that dialogue to make it mm -hmm. clear that these moments are not predatory. These moments are not coercive. Um, yes. it, it's become a mutual thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, we did. We did work on, on that a lot. And I remember actually pulling, uh, pulling lines of dialogue from three or four different versions mm -hmm. <laughs> and compiling it into what ended up on the page. Yeah. Um, because it was just so tricky to to find the balance in that yeah. dynamic. Well, and there were drafts where it would be like, he's really evil. And then another draft where it's like, oh, I went way too far. And yeah. you, you would say, but I like this line, and I like this line, and I like this line. And you would put them together and say, okay, write a scene around this. Mm -hmm. so, which is really interesting, because I've never had that presented to me before. I've never had someone say, here's the dialogue. Make everything else happen. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we played a lot of Django with this particular story. Yeah. Um, a lot of Django. <laughs> um, so now both books are available on NetGalley. They were yes. available for review copies when they both came out, but Roots decided that they're going to do a big marketing push and you've just put both books up at the same time. And you were saying mm -hmm. the reviews you're seeing are, the reactions are really different now that people can just bang, bang, read it. Yeah, it's um, fascinating to see the responses um, and people, it's, it's interesting to me and I think it speaks a little bit to just the way publishing has primed readers to deal with books in a series mm -hmm. um, because like most of the reviews that I'm seeing complain about not enough explanation in book one. Um, they think the world building is a little thin and they want more information. Um, and that's all built into the series. It just, you have to get to book two before you really see that kind of meat on the bones kind of mm -hmm. um, backstory, um, which is a fascinating argument from readers because the other on the other side of that coin are the ones who say that, that you're info dumping <laughs> if you put too much of that in yeah. up front. Um, so it's been really interesting to see because right now the books are both available. I think they're available through September 9th on NetGalley. Um, they're available to anyone. They're just read now. So if you have a NetGalley account, <laughs> go get it. Um, but it's been really interesting to see uh, most of the people who pick up book one do go on to read book two and they do go on to like book two better um which is fascinating because again we we kind of approached it intentionally to treat it as one large story so what that tells me is that you know readers are so used to um the larger houses not really backing a book beyond the first one in the series that the authors have to it puts more pressure on you guys like you mm -hmm. have to like really explain everything right out of the gate but without info dumping it like yeah because because people, i if i get a, a if i have an idea for a five book series but one of the big five is only going to give me a two book deal i might mm -hmm. only get two books out of it so it's that yeah. balance between how much of the five book story do I want to tell in the first two books on mm -hmm. the understanding that I might not get more, but what if I get more, then how do I pad out those other three books or one right. or two 
books because it's not a guarantee that they'll be like, oh, the first two did well. Here's, you know, your whole five book contract. It'll be the first two did well. Give us a third. Maybe give right. us a fourth. And then a year later, yeah. it's the fifth. Like, it's so th there was a lot of safety and security as a writer to be able to take my time, mm -hmm. um, knowing that it, it was a two book deal and it would always be a two book deal. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and in terms of world building, like I'm definitely the kind of person where I don't, I want to, I want to spool it out a little bit at a time. And I really, I trust my readers to be smart enough and clever enough to, to figure it out. I don't feel mm -hmm. like I should have to hold your hand. If I, if I use an idiom over and over again, you, you understand, like I, I, at no point did I sit down and say, bees are very important in Sealy culture. <laughs> right. But the fact that all their idioms had to do with honey and bees, mm -hmm. there was a scene about the value of honey in breakfast tea. Um, I let the reader come to those own come to those conclusions themselves. I, I trust mm -hmm. my reader to be smart enough to put those puzzle pieces together. So right. it, I do find it fascinating when people say, "I don't understand what this piece of slang means, or what why these people are called this, or." Right. What, what is this world building thing? It was never explained to me. Mm -hmm. My answer is, it doesn't need to be explained. You just need to internalize it and understand that this is how the culture is structured and then make up your own reasons. Right. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, um, that's been one of the most interesting parts of seeing the feedback for both books um, is just it's, it's made me reflect a lot on the way that we approach a series as a whole, as readers now. Um, I think we're so used to, whether we know it or not, we're so used to the fact that the author is only given one shot. Like they're, every series, even from an established author, is treated as though that first book is make or break. There's nothing guaranteed past that. Mm -hmm. Whereas in this was more of a traditional approach, I guess. Um, like I look back on the books that I read as a young adult, which were not classified as young adult back then, um, but I don't remember them spoon feeding me the world building in a series. Like I went into a series knowing I was reading a series and that there was X number of books before I got the full story. Um, and I think some of that patience has been lost, but yeah, it's fascinating. That's something that another reviewer has said before, and they were specifically talking about the Accidental Turn series, but, and, and specifically, specifically about the Untold Tale, but um, someone said, you have to remember the art of being a patient reader in order mm -hmm. to, in, in order to enjoy J.M. Fry which I think was a very big compliment for me, at least I felt that way, because um, I, I write, I mean, like, for me, the fantasy archetype, my hero fantasy writer is Jennifer Robertson, who mm -hmm. wrote the Shape Changers series. Yep. And which I absolutely adored. <laughs> oh my God, I discovered it when I was in my teens, early teens, I think I was like 13 years old. Um, there was an old battered copy in one of those take one, give one, libraries mm -hmm. at a campground we went to that book changed my life like finding mm -hmm. that book made me a storyteller made me a better storyteller and jennifer doesn't lay everything out you mm -hmm. have to and that moment in the first book spoilers everyone where <laughs> um the characters you think are the the bad guys who kidnapped the heroine and have been spending the whole first half of the book trying to convince her that they're the good guys the moment her perspective changes, mm -hmm. ah, I felt the world drop out from under me. No author had ever, it wasn't even tricking. It was, nobody had no. ever shown me before <clears throat> that personal, personal identity and personal bias and personal culture and the hegemony of a character mattered so much to how the story was told. And for me, that was, that was something I wanted to do with Skylark, is I really wanted Robin to really believe that this is what the Klon are, and this is what the Bene are, and this mm -hmm. is what my arch nemesis is. And then to just keep pulling those rugs out from under her. Yeah. For the, the series. There's actually a lot about the Skylark series that reminds me of The Shape Changers by uh, 
Jennifer Robeson. <laughs> I remember the first time anyone could ever give me. The first time I read the first book in her series, I remember getting to the end and being so shocked that I immediately went back to the beginning and read it again. Yeah. <laughs> and I'd never done that. Series. I didn't know it was a series for like 15 years. Yeah. I just reread Shape Changers every year. And then one year, like three years ago, like I was in my 30s yeah. when I finally read the cover and it said book one of the Chesui Chronicles. And I was like, whoa, wait a minute. You're like, what? What? <laughs> And I haven't noticed this whole time. Yeah. I personally think the first book is the best in the whole I series. I agree. But yeah, I, so there was a lot about the way that Skylark, as a duology, I'm not going to say as the first book, because yeah. it's really that moment, that like gut punching moment <laughs> that makes you want to go reread the whole thing instantly happens in book two. But um there's a lot about it that it, it is very similar to that. And I, that book really affected me too when I read it. I think I was 18 or 19 when I found mm -hmm. it. And um, there's only been a handful of times that I've ever had that much of a visceral reaction to a book or even reread them. Um, so the fact that I did it both instantly, <laughs> <laughs> like it, it left a mark on me. So that, I think that's something I look for as an acquisitions editor too. Yeah. Like I want... I want a book to affect me that way. Yeah. Even if it's not the ending I expect. Like if it makes me react that strongly, then yeah. I'm in. And again, that's why I, I love books that look like they've been thrown across the room and people who message me and say, I hate, I hate your villain. I hate this. This is terrible. <laughs> and I'm like, good, good. Yeah. You're supposed to. It yeah. means that I've done my job. If I can make you feel anything, I win. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, you are, you're very good at the gut punch, too. <laughs> oh, thank you. Well, I think we only have about five more minutes, so do you have any, any final thoughts, anything you'd like to leave with the people who've been listening to Skylark this whole time? Um, if I could leave you with anything, it would be to continue the story, because it gets a lot more intricate and tricky from here. <laughs> Book one is good. Don't get me wrong. There's a lot about it I love. Um, it's got, you know, that kind of Jane Eyre thing going on, a little bit of Beauty and the Beast. Um, kind of reminds me a little of the action of like the Hero and the Crown and the Blue Sword by Robin McKinley. But book two is where it's at. So <laughs> if you've made it this far, you're going to want to keep going. I guarantee it. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for taking the time this afternoon. And yeah, thank uh, you for having me. Well, thank you. And please, you know, stay safe. And uh, everyone Absolutely. out there, um, wear a mask and, uh, and take care of your loved ones. Yep. All right. Bye.